Love Prairie Sportsman? Become a member of Pioneer PBS today. Oh, we nipped it. Lovin is responsible for about 90% of the muskies I've caught. All right. Good little ski to start the day off here. Both the Stargazer and the Long Prairie Treehouse give guests an above ground experience away from city lights. Funding for this program was provided by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Live wide open. The more people know about West Central Minnesota, the more reasons they have to live here. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, where peace, relaxation, and opportunities await and the members of Pioneer PBS. They say it's the fish of 10,000 casts. Today, we're in Maplewood State Park in search of the apex predator lurking beneath Minnesota waters, the muskie. Brandon Olson is from Lockjaw Guide Service in Ottertail County and spends a lot of time on the water chasing muskies. You gotta really go big. The more, the bigger of an oval you can draw or bigger the zero, it's more room for that fish to turn and kind of ambush that bait. You'll, a lot of times you'll see them, they'll come around and they'll almost hesitate under your feet. And when you come up out here, they'll shoot out and grab it. They don't have to eat everything that comes by them like a small pike or walleye or bass or something like that. They can be real choosy. So that's where the, the curiosity comes in. They wanna make sure it's something they wanna eat before they jump on it. So top of the food chain, that's where there's no fear in these fish. That's what makes them so fun to catch. Oh, there's a muskie. There's a muskie right here. He came up and then he swam back down. Well, that was quick. I was just getting it this bucktail back to the boat here and just about to start a figure eight or a big loop here next to the boat when I saw the fish and then our first sighting right away. What have we been out here fishing? 10 minutes? Yeah, maybe. 30 casts? Yeah. I thought they were the fish of 10,000 casts, Brandon. They're the fish of one cast, but sometimes it makes 9,999 9 to get there. I always joke that a good day muskie fishing is seeing one. This is Beers Lake, one of eight major lakes nestled into the 9,250 acre Maplewood State Park. A fishing license isn't necessary for Minnesota residents, but you will need a park pass. With the new moon today, this is, this is the day in September. Generally speaking, all your big fish get caught either on the new moon or full moon. Um, and new moon usually provides better daytime fishing. There's no hard rules in muskie fishing because they can do whatever they want, but there's kind of some guidelines. So you mainly uh, a musky guy, or do you, you kind of a multi-species, or whatever? Uh, multi-species, I would say muskies are probably my favorite, but I do a lot, of, a lot of walleye trips throughout the year, a lot of crappies and bass. But once you became a musky angler, I didn't think you could afford to do anything else. <laughs> you could buy about six, six bass boats with what you got in that musky <laughs> tackle box right there. I ended up starting to make a lot of my own lures. Oh, really? Just because of that, you know, they're 50 bucks a piece. So am I fishing with one of your own creations then? That's McLovin. <laughs> now, this is probably the most important musky question I'm gonna ask you today. Who gets to name the, the lures? Because that's... <laughs> I don't, some of these I think people get out to a party and <laughs> wait till about <laughs> two in the morning and then start naming baits. Sounds like a good time. So 
was 39 degrees when we drove up here this morning. Fall is uh, is beginning. And I'm curious, Randon, what, you know, when the air temp drops like that and the water temperatures start to drop, how does that affect muskies? More times than, it, than not, it actually kicks them up a little bit. And sure. I, I'm not sure, you know, their instincts are kind of to put the feed bag on for fall and get everything ripened up for winter, but I'm not sure if it has something to do with the other fish species slowing down a little bit during cold fronts or what it is. Oh, but, that makes they, sense. They kind of seem to, to kind of kick it into another gear almost during cold fronts. Like all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, that fish is just sitting there. I'm going to eat him. Right. You just never know with muskies. No. Nope. always have to be paying attention, always looking in the water. You never know when there's going to be a fish behind whatever presentation you got out there. And we just finished our first spot here. We came in and worked around this island and back into this bay right here. We did see one fish. Randon was saying he averages about a fish an hour a lot of times on a, on a good day. That's what you were saying. Yep. You'll see a fish an hour. So we've seen one here in the first hour. We're, now we're going to move to the next spot. So we're out of the minor now. One thing I don't really change a whole lot when I get out of the miner, I still want to fish faster. I just like to try to be able to find fish. You can get them to rise up, you come back and you get that little wind change or cloud cover, whatever. It, it's weird what'll trigger them. You know, sometimes it's the smallest thing, like just the cloud goes in front of the sun, all of a sudden they'll get active for five minutes. Musky fishing involves a lot of patience, expensive baits, and a boatload of luck. This is a pose jackpot. This is my all-time favorite musky lure to throw. I've never caught a fish on it <laughs> in 15 years. This would be the time to catch one on it. Uh-huh. Once again, his favorite lure proved to be unlucky, but his next choice was a different story. Two of them, two of them. Double. Come on. Double follow, that's awesome. Two mid 40s, they were good fish. While those two fish gave us some excitement, Randon realized what our problem was. You gotta have a sinking lure stuck in the net. <laughs> You're a little superstitious, aren't you? Yeah. Got to be the musky fish. Whenever we first started, we'd always hook a fish when the net's buried under tackle boxes and you're not ready. Once we started learning to you get your net ready before you even leave the access, you'd go through dry spells where you wouldn't, wouldn't see nothing, wouldn't catch nothing. So we thought, well, maybe we got to go back to having the net hard to get at. So we started throwing lures in the net and it would work. It has to be a sinking lure. You can't throw a topwater and there's something that you're going to be able to just get back. You have, you have to be willing to lose it. And, and you can't place it. You have to just throw it wherever it lands, that's it. Well, that's a superstition I've never heard of before, <laughs> but it worked. Not a giant, but a good starter fish. Hey, all right, on the board. Nice. Not a big one, but it's musky. Good. It's a musky, it's a good start. Got this one casting a Medusa, uh, it's a big rubber bait. They work really good in the fall. Um, we're in that fall transition time here where kind of a lot of different things are working. You just got to figure out what they want each day. So this is a really nice true musky. A lot of times you'll get these spots on the smaller ones for a while and they'll clear up kind of when they get older. but. Beautiful fish here. Nice big sharp teeth on her. Yeah, she's a gorgeous fish. She's gonna be big some days. Get her back in the water and let her go. So today is the new moon. Generally speaking, most of your big fish that you hear getting caught of every year are either on the new moon or the full moon. They say the new moon's better for daytime. And the full moon's better nighttime. I think it's a lot to do with like the pressure in the sky and stuff. It's the lunar tables is what it goes off of the tides out of the ocean. I blame aliens. That's <laughs> and Bigfoot. Over the next couple of hours, we hit each part of the lake, trying out a number of different presentations. Oh yeah, he's still there. 
Yep. Oh, he nipped it. But the big fish just wouldn't commit. Oh. <sighs> Hate musky fishing. <laughs> While we hadn't caught any muskies on it, there was one lure in particular that was getting their attention. The Tinkerbell, it's not completely my idea. It's completely homemade, it's uglier than sin. The fish like it, it works good, it's a heavy bait. Let's explain why that bait is so heavy. <laughs> so back in high school, uh, my shop teacher had made kind of a, it's a fake musket, but he used like, made a wood stock, put conduit for, for the barrel on it and everything, and he had to make something to make a ball for it, you know. They milled out a chunk of aluminum into a round ball to fit into that. Well, they never used a mold again, so I took the mold home, and that's what we made the head a Tinkerbell out of. So it's just a, it's a, I don't even know what caliber that would be, but <laughs> it's, it's a big one. Musky caliber. Musky caliber. Tinkerbell tantalized the muskies to some degree but did not have the mesmerizing effect that Medusa did. Oh! <laughs> Still got him? Yeah, yeah, he's hooked pretty good. We got there, Randon. Nice musky. Oh yeah, it is. Oh, I guess she's barely hooked. I'm gonna play her kind of easy. She's just hooked in the side. Okay. And we got her. All right. Woo. That's a little better one. Nice. Nice. That is a gorgeous fish. What I've heard over the years, and, and I don't know for sure, but I've heard that a 40 inch muskie is about 10 years old and that they'll grow quick till they hit 40. Um, and then they slow up after that. So 44, are probably 13 years old, 14 years old, something like that. It's really amazing how an experience with one big muskie can really change a guy's opinion on wanting to chase him. You know, literally hook a guy into muskie fishing. My, my best analogy is it's catch and release deer hunting. <laughs> yeah. It's that same feeling when you're sitting in your deer stand, you're tired of watching squirrels, and all of a sudden that big buck walks out and your knees start shaking, and it's the same feeling when you see that muskie. Muskie fever. Muskie fever. The whimsical decor features Jill stenciling and quotes from the trilogy throughout. The theme extends to the gardens below where chainsaw artist Mark Kurtz turned an odd-shaped stump into a hobbit creature. Which crayfish is native to Minnesota and which is the invader? The answer is coming up right after this. Treehouse Masters has inspired many dreams of building a lodge that reaches to the sky. Two couples living in Minnesota's heartland did more than dream. They built the Long Prairie Treehouse in Stargazer Sky Cabin that offered guests an uplifting experience. In both cases, one spouse had to convince the other that this wasn't just a crazy fantasy. Uh, three different areas of land that you know I dreamt about building a tree house and my husband kept trying to talk me out of it and then I started buying stuff for the inside of it knowing that someday I would have a tree house and it took a lot of years to finally have it come true. So she brought this wood stove home one day and she, what's that for? Well, it's for the treehouse. The home the Lavoys purchased in 1999 only had two bedrooms, and Joyce insisted they needed a guest house so their kids had a place to sleep when they visited. She had read all the books by treehouse master Peter Nelson and had a pretty good idea how she wanted it designed. Neighbors Ron and Nancy Leesman, a carpenter and an artist, 
drew up plans and helped them frame it up. With the help of friends, daughters, and boyfriends, the treehouse took about two years to complete. This is uh, Richard and I putting on uh, the siding. Isn't this great, this woman up here just with that drill? <laughs> she didn't do that. Much. Oh, yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> Trust me. Building the outhouse. We had this whole group that would be called the Flush of Crappers that came out to help us tip the toilet up. This is uh, one of the cards that um, I got from my daughter that she said, dream big. The tree house is built on three red oaks. The deal is if you ever built a deer stand between two trees and them trees wobble in the wind and it breaks the board. So I had to cobble up a deal. I made a, some beams, some white oak beams there, doubled up two by 12s. And then uh, they'll slide on these steel brackets that I made. So it'll give a little bit. The ceiling's quite a deal. It, uh, you know, it was all that kind of open. We didn't know how to finish it off and stuff. And so I got that galvanized tin there and stuff. You get, you get your uh, little place to eat and a little bottle, place to drink your bottle of wine, place to relax, place to sleep. It has deck around two thirds of it. And so there's room for chairs and tables and just to sit out. And the best thing about sitting up that high, especially um, in the summertime out here, is that the mosquitoes don't go up that high. A friend donated old windows, but in hindsight, the Lavoie say they should have spent money on new ones. The story I tell my uh, people who come to visit is, the windows never leak when the sun shines. It, they leak a little when, the, when it rains a little. <laughs> And they leak a lot when it rains a lot. The house is lit with lanterns and candles as the only electricity comes from an extension cord running from their house. I tell people it may charge your phone, but don't expect more than that. <laughs> Originally, the guest house was only intended for family and friends until it was featured in the Minneapolis Tribune. Could somebody call up and they stay? Well, I suppose, you know, we're not fussy. And then Joyce evolved into her bed and breakfast and, and would bring them something to eat. And a bottle of wine and a t-shirt and the whole deal. The Lavoys rent the treehouse to guests on a limited basis. The only marketing is by word of mouth and media stories, including a feature on CBS. A few years ago, the Lavoys heard about another couple who had built a tree high cabin in Uppsala. So we were over that one day and stopped in to meet them and we liked them, they had quite the deal. We really are happy to have other people join um, kind of the unconventional things in life were just so nice and we got to be friends with them and um, have shared campfires yeah, yeah, and so we were just over there a few weeks ago as a like Joyce Jill had to convince her spouse to build on high we're sitting in front of our timber frame cottage uh, it started out as my music studio and also a guest space. Then, you know, we were watching Treehouse Masters and we were like, oh, this is so cool. It'd be fun to do that. But uh, Joan is a little more commonsensical than I am, so she uh, said that would probably be stupid. <laughs> well, you know, um, uh, you so, to, uh, well, you have to understand, we had done a lot of renovation projects clearing of the land, I was done. And when she wanted to build a tree house, I was really cold to the idea. And uh, so I thought, you know, in my desperation, I said, maybe we could, you know, rent it out. She goes, oh, you, if you think we could rent it out, let's rent out what we've got and see what happens. And then I thought, pop goes my dream, but we put it on uh, Airbnb and within hours we had pings happening. We went into St. Cloud and I was driving on the way home. We got three reservations and so we, it was just really a hit. But on the basis of that success, then we decided to go ahead and with building a Stargazer. We uh, are both Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter fans. And we decided on the Lord of the Rings theme mostly uh, for her. 
Jill and Joan employed their artistic talents in designing while building the Stargazer Sky Cabin. With the help of contractors, it took about 18 months to complete. Some unusual features tested their patience, like the floor. We went through all kinds of things with it and, and freaked out many times, and many times Joan said, do we have to have a cool floor? Could we just have a floor? A nice floor. <laughs> Does everything have to be cool? The floor is covered with epoxy that had to be stirred constantly in small quantities to prevent air bubbles. Basically, for every 15 minutes of stir, we had two minutes of pour, and we had a whole floor to do it. It took us all day. And uh, I said to Jill at some point, I, I'm feeling a little mom and pop kettleish here, you know, just sitting around <laughs> here stirring the epoxy, you know. But. After a Google search for ideas, they designed a dumbwaiter system on a garage door opener track installed vertically so guests don't have to haul luggage up the steep stairs. Although the Stargazer isn't actually built on trees, it has an outdoor feel with 53 windows and tree branches reaching to the high ceilings. The whimsical decor features Jill stenciling and quotes from the trilogy throughout. The theme extends to the gardens below where chainsaw artist Mark Kurtz turned an odd-shaped stump into a hobbit creature. Smug is uh, from Lord of the Rings, of course, and The Hobbit, um, but this is not smog, which was the case for the Tolkien invention. This is smug. Uh, Smog's twin sister, who doesn't have all of the horrible testosterone issues that makes her brother like roast people alive. <laughs> and she also is not a hoarder. She just wants the flowers to grow up around her and um, be peaceful. With fold down beds, the Stargazer sleeps six, and the cabin, five. Both are solar powered and made with recycled materials, such as wood from a house that was about to be demolished. Chickens are part of the experience, and every guest receives a half dozen eggs when they arrive. Different, we have different color eggs. We have uh, chickens that lay blue and green eggs. And then I write a little chicken story in with each thing of eggs, which sometimes one of the chickens, you know, thinks she's found true romance with Leo Leghorn down the road. And <laughs> yeah, so it's called, the, the, the collection is called the Chicken Chronicles. Both the Stargazer and the Long Prairie Treehouse give guests an above-ground experience away from city lights. And they just kind of want to come and see the stars again and get some R&R, &R, build a bonfire, lay in a hammock, kick back, get in the hot tub. A great place to relax, uh, quiet, which you can't find very often anymore and I love sharing it with others. Which crayfish is native to Minnesota and which is the invader? The invader is rusty crayfish. How do we tell the invasive rusty from the native calico crayfish? Rusty crayfish have red spots on the sides of its carapace. Calico do not. Rusty crayfish claws form an oval when closed. Calico claws have a distinctive notch in their pinchers. Rusty crayfish grow up to five inches long. Calicos grow to only three and a half inches. Why are rusty crayfish a problem? They destroy aquatic plant beds and displace native crayfish. Invasive crayfish breed with native and replace the population with hybrids. Rusty crayfish consume fish eggs and compete with fish for prey. Where are they found? Rusty crayfish are often found in shallow, two to three feet deep water on a variety of bottoms. We can stop these invaders from infesting more lakes and streams by cleaning up everything we pull out of the water. It's a simple drill. Clean in, clean out. Before leaving a water access, clean your boat and water equipment. Remove and dispose of all plants and aquatic species in the trash. Remove drain plugs from your boat, drain bilge, live well, and bait containers, and keep them out when transporting your watercraft. 
dispose of unwanted bait in the trash. If you have been in infested waters, also spray your boat with high pressure water. Rinse with very hot water. Dry for at least five days. Stop the spread of AIS. Funding for this segment was provided by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Wright, Meeker, Yellow Medicine, Laquaparle, and Big Stone Counties. Funding for this program was provided by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Live wide open. The more people know about West Central Minnesota, the more reasons they have to live here. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, where peace, relaxation, and opportunities await and the members of Pioneer PBS. All of these beams are poplar. Poplar is kind of a hard, soft wood, and we actually harvested those locally, um, which was kind of fun to just go out in the woods. We're really starting from mm -hmm. scratch. But these are like old cedar telephone poles. They're 80 years old, and so those are recycled from telephone poles. Mm -hmm. 